The following is an episode with John Edker, previously the director of community at DeviantArt, and then went on to be the chief of technology and VP of strategy at DigitalOcean. I'm John, and right now I'm based in uh, Canada. However, I've spent the least amount of my life in Canada. John now works with us at Codesphere, and today we talk a lot about how to grow community. We talk about what leadership is and what it means to grow a non-toxic community in the environment today. I spend about 80% of my time uh, focusing on um, Codesphere, uh, which is a startup that was funded by a few of my friends. And um, uh, I got kind of got involved in the very beginning as um, I've been doing a lot of consulting, which is sort of what I spend kind of the remaining 10 percent or sort of 20 percent of my time on this episode is brought to you by codesphere find out more at codesphere.com subscribe to the podcast at everywhere good podcasts are made enjoy the episode nice you, you mentioned there that you started off as a consultant and a few of your friends were um funding codesphere so what were you doing like immediately before? What, why were you the consulting guy? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, I've just done startup forever. I've never done anything other than startups. Um, forever. I've never had a startups job. Startups forever. Than startups with a startup. And I kind of actually didn't even want to do startups anymore because <laughs> I've been doing them for so long and startups are hard um and i guess it just moved i realized it was possible to still be involved in startups and not go nuts like not feel stressed out um and start because startups are hard and i just done a a startup like i'd done back back to back startups my whole career (laughs) i hadn't taken a break and uh and so I was thinking I needed to take a break. Um, but I guess my experience of having spent my whole career in startups and seeing them at all sizes from just ideas all the way through to now publicly traded companies, um, just was getting a lot of requests for people uh, to mostly like guys, my friends who had been in startups and done startups and they were like, Hey, you know, I'm funding this startup. Will you, you know, talk to this founder or whatever about this thing that, you know, you saw or you failed at mostly (laughs) and uh, explain why you failed at it or what, you know, in the odd occasion, why you, why we were successful at it. And, um, and code sphere, Specifically, I had gotten from all angles because um, it very much jived with sort of all just a lot of the stuff I'd thought about for a long time when we were building the strategy for DigitalOcean. It was a lot of having to think about really far into the future of what cloud and development was going to look like so that you could make solid bets in the near term future. Mm -hmm. And so that really far future that we had been thinking about, you know, in 2015, 2016 is now. So now we live in that reality, what's true and how can the past inform what the future sort of looks like a little bit. So I guess that was the pitch to me. And then I, um, I was like a cat. I was basically like, nope and and was very um very much not interested is that like you answered nine eight times and then each time you were like no and you got away with it and the ninth time it killed you it's you had to really do it. pretty much exactly that actually is like <laughs> yeah and like it was like oh, okay, i probably can't ignore another email from these people i mean I, it's getting to the point of me just looking bad because clearly everyone thinks i should like it wasn't just like one person was like, you should talk to this, you know, um, founder. It was like, 
multiple people saying that I should talk to his founder and multiple of my friends slash, you know, funds that I work with putting money into this startup too. So it was like kind of cornered a little bit and like half of it in the beginning was like just doing a favor to my, my buddies, right? Like, Hey, I just put a bunch of cash in the startup. Can you help them think about it? And then as that evolved. Well, it sounds like it's ended well, because now you've, you've moved up of your own free will to... Well, and that's sort of what I wanted it to be, right? And, that's, and, and I'm old enough now to learn. I've learned the lesson of just like, you know, I've made too many dumb mistakes on, on looking, wasting my time in the wrong way. So you only have so much time. So, so spend um, well. to go back to what you said originally, actually, uh, so you, you kind of obviously, you felt cornered by your so-called friends to join the company. <laughs> Um, what, what, uh, we're really making yeah, this yeah, sound yeah. horrible, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't <laughs> quite as bad as I'm uh, making it sound. Friends with air quotes. Actually, fine, fine, but um, but but you said that uh, you got a really good sign from the, the the team and you liked them. Like for for people who might not be as fortunate uh, with their kind of like friend base as you were, what what is a good sign for for a founding team? And like, uh, what what did you like about them? That's kind of like transposable to other startups. When I told them that they didn't have product market fit yet, they listened. Okay. That's relatively uncommon. And then I think the other thing that's uncommon then is another thing that I stumble across a lot when I'm consulting to startups is, oh, maybe you sort of have some product market fit or whatever, but really understanding truly why. And it's not just like, well, this customer likes this thing or like really understand. And it's not even which I think is where most people probably stop is it's not even as like far as like, Oh, I understand the value exchange here. You really need to get into what is the landscape? What am I like? What is the paradigm shift that's happening? What happened in the past that require that like requires me to be here or someone like me to be here. If it wasn't me, there would be someone else. And you need to do that because that informs your path on what the future would look like and and Mm. like what are you being a part of because there's no startup that's moving reality on its own that's sort of why the whole gag of like i'm here to change the world is just like we we all laugh at it right yeah sure the world is changing certainly and you're welcome to be a part of that change if, if you so choose to and you can and you have the resources and the privilege but you're unbelievably naive if you think that you are the change tim me and you just are talking earlier about how we're going to change the world with this this, this podcast <laughs> can i cancel the podcast <laughs> i imagine that's a good idea you know i'm just gonna go now but it was really <laughs> <laughs> final guest of the show but that's interesting about um it's interesting you saying about uh, people actually listening but like you know listening to the experts and sorry what uh <laughs> oh, listen um but but yeah i mean i mean i think that that's um, but it's like beyond sorry i was just gonna say i think that's why people are drawn to the space because i think that um there's that that level of arrogance kind of like in in the startup is is there's no real room for it a a successful in any way you'd argue i don't think that there is i think that there is only the ability to persist i mean you're gonna be wrong about it almost everything right like in fact in fact that's half of what i teach my founders right is to be to learn to be comfortable with and to find as quickly as possible process and move through failure because that's all startup is right i mean that old 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 adage as lame as it is of failing your way to success Mm -hmm. as lame as it is is completely you it's a failure is a prerequisite to success so that's that there's no, I don't think that I just believe, I don't, I'm dogmatic about that belief. Um, and so then it is, does this team have the ability to build itself a framework to to fail its way into this success that we talk about? Right. And so then that, what I was saying, going to say before, before I tried to rudely up, interrupt you as I tend to do, um, is that, it's beyond just listening, but it's saying it's then being analytical about the listening thereafter and saying, well, if this is signal in the noise or this guy is not crazy, then 
how do I reframe my reality into that reality and rebuild a framework and then gather data and process that data and find out what truth looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think the caliber of the team is then thereafter their ability, how much they can do that with or without your help or with or without the help of experts or, or with the help of experts and like going out, but basically actually just going away, listening, going away, and then coming back a month later and saying, okay, I listened to what you said and either you were right for these reasons and here are the reasons or you were wrong. For so what is it you did then in these startups for um, startups forever, startups from the beginning? What is your, your company role? startups forever? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. You should start that. John, yeah. John Edgar startups forever. Startups um, forever, mate. Yeah. What, what have you traditionally done or what like uh, major roles have you played throughout the, the years? Do you want a startup for a tenner down the market? I'll sell you a startup. I'll give you a start for a nine bob note. Nine bob note, no problem. <laughs> you, you know what? If you, buy it, if you buy it today, I'll give you, you a you. bubble in you. Yeah? <laughs> start um, for a tenner. Start for a tenner. That would be my slogan, right? But a tenner is actually like a lot of money. We'll, re, we'll reframe that. Um, um, that's a disclaimer. Like, oh, that's, that's a small print. Start yeah, for a tenner, yeah. asterisk. asterisk a for a European tenor, audience where, where, out there, it's a national audience. A tenner is 10 British pounds, dollars. 10 pounds worth oh, yeah. of, of currency on the British Isles. So well, start you, you're, you're probably talking more of a 10 bag. Do you know what that is, John? No. 10,000 pounds. Oh, that's 10,000 like pounds. Something. That's the kind of currency that I work in, right? 10 bricks. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting into drug dealer money now. And I don't think that's appropriate for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, um, you know, VC startup investor money, it's, it's, it's a whole world apart. You know, I always start off in this role of like something specific and then stay in it for about three minutes. Um, and I, I think that's just sort of because I like that whole idea of like, what is the actual base reality here? Like digging into that. So, and I think also in all of my jobs where I've been successful, the my boss or the founder or whatever the CEO has like sort of just been like this guy's asks good questions and is good at problem solving so let's just like put him in here and give him some general direction to see what happens um where I've been able to be successful is in all in all those instances is where I've been able to like just ask a lot of questions and then regurgitate those questions back in and have people listen to them so then yeah so then that's what i do I just go in and ask really annoying questions i've done that basically i think my whole career and but some people really value those annoying questions because um, they're annoying they're like the real questions right um it's like if this thing is a prerequisite to this next thing what's your plan for that mm -hmm. And the answer, like hope is not a strategy. The answer can't be like, well, whatever, right? But is that, um, is that also a difficult area to navigate? Because I think that um, action... Yeah, I'm, I'm a lot better at not pissing people off than I used to be, let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, sorry, sorry, Tim, he just said hope is not a strategy. I mean, tell the rebel alliance though. Yeah, yeah. Re rebellions are built on hope. The, the, the style of conversation you're talking about is like having a good thought or a good discussion and then turning it into actionable processes like what the the person you know that the person who kind of I guess listens and then and then actually actions it that's the real skill um is that something you've kind of um you've kind of come up against when people have kind of like got the talk they talk the talk but they don't walk the walk is that very common it, sure you know? the vast majority of people are terrible executors yeah but i mean is it then you go to is it their fault probably not yes right so why are they terrible executors Okay. Are the incentives wrong? Is the structure wrong? Are they being managed wrong? It's usually your fault. They're being led wrong, whatever. Usually, uh, like often it's an incentivization thing, but actually, well, probably more frequently, it's like just a misalignment with the vision or mission of the business and a misunderstanding of what one should be doing to baseline contribute to the business such that one actually feels valuable in, mm. in that they're actually doing work that in this, we're going to make a publicly traded company. They can understand why if they weren't there doing that work to build that publicly traded company, like we might not get there. Right. Everyone mm -hmm. needs to feel that that's like finding your flow. Um, 
I'm reading a book right now called One Mission. It's good. It's about this stuff. It's about like uh, finding finding like company culture and. It's about why. It's about how vision, mission, and purpose go together in anything, in community building. It, when you are dealing with people, and people need to move forward. If it's Xi Jinping with China, if it's Ilias with Code Sphere, or you know, if it's John C. Maxwell with his mega church, good leadership is good. Communities need leaders, right? I mean, it's sort of a prerequisite for um, communities because they either emerge or 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 they are built around the leader. Um, and good leaders ask good questions, and so you know, that's. That's what this is all about, is leadership. Well, actually, that's a nice segue into the the next point I want to talk about, and that was working with people and community. And I wanted to draw on your vast well of experience in growing communities for DigitalOcean and, I guess, more prolifically for um, DeviantArt back in the day. Um, So I guess my question really is just high level. Let's just start at the top. How does culture grow or how do communities grow? Well, I think that sort of comes back to that leadership thing that I was just talking about is like, so I get this question. A lot of people come to me a lot for community building consulting and, um, it's like, they kind of want the community to just like emerge, um, spontaneously in, in their living room. Like they just click their fingers and the community's there in their living room. But that's not how community building works. Um, in reality, some people are hanging out in the park. Some people are hanging out down by the waterfront. Some people are skating at the skate park. Some people are shopping in the grocery store. And if you want them all to come to your living room, you have to go meet those groups and you have to talk to them. And then you have to uh, hope some percentage of them will come to your living room you know, next Wednesday to have Bible class or coding session or Pokemon watching party or whatever thing you're trying to build. Right. But the point is that the community is sort of already there. They're just dispersed. They're not really like they're fragmented. Right. And so your job is sort of to think like, what environment do I need to create for these people to want to congregate together? And then when they congregate together, how can I make sure that, you know, they have a good experience and that whatever they, whatever value proposition I had, right. That whatever they were going to get out of putting their time into coming to this thing and, and contributing to whatever it is. Right. Um, uh, um, that's all understood that you've thought about that and that, and that you help them to think about it, that you give them frameworks for being successful in your community. Right. That's sort of your job as a good community leader, or a good steward. And that like, I mean, in, in DeviantArt, we grew really, really quickly. And we had a lot of di- like art is a huge thing. And, mm-hmm. and in the beginning, it was just MP3 skins and like skins for Palm Pilots and stuff like that. And then well, we Palm added Palm like, well. yeah. And then we added like digital art and then we added like, so then I remember like, you know, got into digital art, but then that's too wide. So then you'd add a sub tier. So we added anime and then, you know, within anime, you have, um, furries and, and, and whatever, right. All the different. Shout out to the furries. Of, uh, well, yeah. D- DeviantArt was like a home of the furries. For a while. Furries. I know a lot about furries. I actually, um, did a campaign for, uh, an old Warner brothers film called like Jack Frost or something. And it was like, um, and it's like the characters like Jack Frost, the Easter bunny, Santa Claus, and they're like, but they're kind of a bit more like myth mythologized. And I was trying to find artwork to put as Twitter posts and stuff, and like just kind of give the pitch a bit of flavor. And I went down this rabbit hole, excuse the pun, of deviant art, furry art of Jack Frost, the sixteen-year-old person, and and the rabbit, the Easter Bunny, voiced by Hugh Jackman. There's, there was a wealth of content. Let's just put it there. I'm just going to leave it at that. Wealth of content. Yeah. 
So if you wanted to do a PhD on furries, I think DeviantArt would be like the, the compendium of the knowledge that you would probably pull draw from. I mean, it's all there for sure. The history of the history of uh, of uh, furry as it pertains to anime on the on the net is pretty much happened on DeviantArt. But my point on that is like. <laughs> So how do you grow all of that when you have all the way up from people who are interested in Palm Pilots and MP3 player skins like Winamp skins? Like DeviantArt almost started around Winamp skins as an idea. And so you have like, you have to provide a lot of frameworks and you kind of have to both, you have to make them malleable enough that anything can go through them or like the or that what's supposed to go through them can go through them right so like you don't want to f and by frameworks i mean like in the case of deviant art you would be talking about literally how you submit the art so like the flow of uploading the art into the website may be different for every sub tier a little bit generally the same flow, but you might be asked some different questions. Um, the rules for the community might be a little bit different. The types of moderators that you hired would most certainly be different. I mean, and so you're being really thoughtful about who are the real people that are in this community. Not like they're, it's not an abstract, can't be an abstract thing, right? It's not an abstract thing, they're humans at the end of the day it's just people and their ideas so you're providing the environment right you're providing the petri dish for that community to grow in be it your company at work your team as you're managing your church your deviant art community whatever your discord server your twitch stream doesn't matter it's all the same thing it's just people right and so again back to the whole thing of like what is community whatever it's all if you are interested in this stuff you're probably interested in leadership it's leading what is leadership it's asking good questions once and providing frameworks for questions and providing framework for knowledge to emerge and providing framework for people to act on that knowledge to to not analyze what's happening and then ask more good questions i think as humans fundamentally that's what we like to do we like to congregate tell stories answer questions learn more about why we're here share more about our existence right and i don't think that is limited to just you know churches or or community halls or or whatever i think Mention that's churches a few true. times there. you've got religion on your mind at the minute i think well because what is one of the biggest examples of communities that get and formed in societies religion, yeah. fellowship is religion very much so right and so, so be, uh, like a lot like i give one of the books that I give to, uh, or authors that I give, well, a lot of his books are good tailored, but he's, he, he's John C. Maxwell. He, what does he do? He runs a mega church and he teaches and he has some amazing books. I just, I'm a Buddhist. I ignore all the stuff. I mean, sure. Jesus has had some cool lessons. No problem. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm not into religion particularly. Um, but that's chill. It doesn't matter. I'm into community. And so, you know, I mean, you can even track the pro a lot of the problems back in, in the world to like interpretations of people's work and then those interpretations being spread through as, as dogma or doctrine into communities and then those communities carrying that understanding and that knowledge into the world. Um, leadership is a, is a, is a, with great power comes great responsibility. But you take that, um, you take that kind of... You're not going to not react to that start Spider-Man reference there, Tim. Uh, so you'd, you'd be all over that. The funny thing is you keep saying, I'm like, no, I've never seen Spider-Man or, or that other thing that you said before, uh, Star, Star Wars. Wars. I've watched any the Star Wars. The other thing that we said before. Oh, <laughs> my God. Right, that's it. That's an oh. instant disqualification from podcasts. What were you going to say, Tim? Go, go, you um, yeah, I was going to say... Had, that if you did like real sci-fi like Star Trek, I would be fine, but I don't watch junk. But anyway, carry on. Oh my god! Oh my god! Um, it's okay. We can get past this. It's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah. So I, I really wanted to just um, kind of dive into just that. Good practice, good leadership. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From a certain yeah. point of view. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, you're talking about uh, like the a fledgling community and being a good leader, and like um, you know, obviously there's a certain amount that you can kind of like be the person on the on the mount giving the sermon and kind of uh, guiding the party yourself. But when the community kind of like uh, takes flight and gets its own life. Um, I was reading a lot about this whole kind of like balance between having these like flag bearers, this kind of like the original, the original people who are just like, okay, there's a hundred people in this community and they're like the, they're the sort of like, they're, they're the gatekeepers in a positive well, sense, yeah. you know? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, interesting? And then you've got, then, then the, the, then the community kind of like grows from there and you're kind of as a, as a company, do you then let the community kind of like just do its own thing and you just sort of see what happens and you, and you kind of monitor the natural progression or, are you always kind of like steering and moving and, and being that leader or, or does the community basically just like get a life of its own? I mean, I think it depends. I, don't, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. Right. I mean, say in the instance of like deviant art, deviant art decided to take a turn uh, in, a, in a, in a direction in like, I don't know, 2000. And, I don't even, can't even remember what year 2000. 12 or something and but knew that it was going to change the community and it was going to isolate a lot of people a lot of people would leave but that was okay that was a decision that they had to, to make right they they wanted to change the community and change the business um that could be true again like just i'll always just i think just use the church as the example when i want to just go to a societal thing but it can yeah. be as like you know inner inner interspersed for your badminton club or, or you know, whatever your hockey team it doesn't really matter um so i think one thing is like you don't unless you're trying to build a toxic community or you're trying to like cause harm in the world or hurt other people you want to like generally i think in the beginning being relatively dogmatic with your first 100 to 200 people that are engaged in whatever it is that you're doing about how and, and really because you want those early people to um people who are on the fence you really want them to self-opt out right you don't la later want to have to be like kicking people out of your community publicly and stuff like that it's just like look at all that shit on hacker news you see sometimes it's just not and so a lot of that is like you know we saw when the, the influx of code of conducts in, in 2015 and 2016 into like the JavaScript and, you know, and those communities changed and some people didn't want to be a part of it and some people fought it, whatever, right? Um, wherever possible, you want to set, you want to, that's why being thought, like, that's why this leadership thing is almost like, it's a very selfless thing, Right. Like the only person I really know who's like in their community and also running their community and is the voice of their community and has been like relatively successful. And, but I think it's just because of what it is, is Linus with Linux. But that's because you kind of almost have to be a little bit um, prescriptive when you're building something like an operating system, I think. Right. Um, but I don't think that net like. So like, what are your values? How do you think about how you want your community to grow? Do you want it? Like one of the things in DeviantArt was whenever we would create a new tier, I would, we would like reshuffle our duties in the back end. So someone like someone would move, someone would be stretched somewhere. Someone would move to help desk maybe. And then someone who like, if say the person who was doing help desk was really versed in that um, sub tier or close enough, <laughs> say they knew about um, uh, digital art generally, and they kind of like watched some anime. So then we would really just say to that person like, okay, go. And they would be, let me mute my phone. So that that's not beeping every, um, um, so they'd say kind of go and then they would be going in there very frequently and guiding the community. So often you would see like a, cri a critique on a piece of art, right? And you'd see so you put this piece of art up and then someone would say, yeah, this is shit. I don't like X, Y, Z. So then what we would do is we would go back in, we would go in and we would find that and we would literally rewrite it as a real critique that we would want to see on the website. And we'd basically just say, this is how these critiques should be written. And by the way, if they're not written like this moving forward, people will be banned kind of thing and then you keep referencing back to those critiques 
and then people who don't get it, either they leave themselves or they get banned. They're out. They're gone. You know? um, and eventually, like you said, that sort of builds these positive gatekeepers, right? Where people say, hey, I'm not telling you this because I'm, I want, you know, I'm in charge or anything like this. I'm telling you this because you're going to get yourself in some hot water if you keep running down this line. And I appreciate having you in this community. I actually like having you around, but I want, you know, this is how we do things here. And, and then often, you know, as you get to a certain scale, then like, I think it does, the community has internal debates, they evolve themselves forward. Some people opt out, new people come in and the community evolves. You lose some people, you gain some people, but isn't that true to life? As you progress, you lose old friends and you gain new friends and in, in, in your, in your office, as you're, you know, you start off where you need some generalists and then you need some specialists and then the generalists, you know, they don't want to move over to another area of the business and learn a new skill. So they move on to a new company and that's totally okay. That's, you know, should be normal. Um, these are normal things, the ebbs and flows of life. It's all just people work, right? Yeah. So I was going to say then about how do we how do we make sure a community we're building, you know, doesn't become a toxic community. I think you kind of answered it there. It's more like this kind of pruning the community and setting it on the right path, and then over time, uh, if you if you set it on the correct path, the toxicity or the toxic members will will either be pushed out or leave on their own. Yeah, and reinforcing positive behavior when you see a community member taking it upon themselves to say, Hey, just an FYI, here's the rules. And if I were going to write this, like, um, uh, you know, if, if, if I were going to give this comment, I would, I would give it this way and rewrite it this way. We would all, if I saw that free subscription for a month for that person, six months subscription, senior member, deviant of the year award, don't whatever. We had all that shit. Of course we did. And then that gave us systems to reinforce positive behavior. And ne- like you couldn't even burst the bubble. The culture was too strong. No one could infiltrate it and fuck it up. You couldn't turn it toxic. It was too hard to poison the well. But that sort of this thing about like culture will grow in a vacuum, right? Where you leave a space for the culture to fill itself in, it will. So if that space isn't thought about of what you want that to fill in with, it's just going to decide on its own. It's just going to mm. fill with whatever it wants, well, right? I've I've, um, I've heard that that's the kind of like excuse that YouTube has. They the, apparently the, the high high level CEOs of YouTube. That's their excuse that they never they never thought that it would become the platform it is. Um, so they never kind of like prepared for the fact that it's become so um, it's become right. it's become so sort of like of a wasteland. So this is Twitch is, ha- is just about to suffer from the same issue. And I've been getting active on Twitch. And I think Twitch is a very interesting platform as it emerges. It's a very cool new way. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's evolving. Interestingly, it reminds me very much of DeviantArt in the early days. In DeviantArt in the early days, you couldn't can move without bumping into either a senior member or a mod or an admin or somebody who was effectively trained in the way of the community trained to train people to help all these sub communities grow healthily on twitch with all these streamers they're trying to grow these communities. They have no support. They're turning toxic. They don't know why. They don't understand why their gatekeepers are are like, um, they're like, oh, I need this person because they're a legacy. Like it's the same with the legacy employees, right? They're a legacy employee. They're a legacy community builder, whatever. They hold institutional knowledge and we value institutional knowledge because how can you, you can't be passing all that through forward yourself, right? But um what is that an ounce of medicine is something there's some an ounce of toxicity is like, I don't know. There's, there's some, just an ounce, like a tiny bit of poison is, is gonna like, gonna make you sick more than like missing the institutional knowledge, knowledge or whatever. Right. Like, um, an ounce of medicine is prevention or something. I don't know. What, there's, there's some phrase. A small dude. amount of toxicity can, can seem bigger than it is. 
A one one bad apple poisons the batch. That's it. There that's we the go. One. There we. There we. Yeah. Go. That's one of them. There we go. I mean, that's, that's true. It's exactly poisons true. the barrel. God, I got it wrong. But that whatever that is, right? You put you put one six salmon in a salmon barrel, and they're all going to die, Satch. <laughs> <laughs> you put one six salmon in a ba- barrel of good apples. God. <laughs> and all the apples turn into frogs. The ab- oh no, yeah, frog like apples. Dumbo. Does a um, salmon yeah, dumbo? <laughs> no, no, you know, but when he falls in the barrel of uh, cider and he gets drunk and there's pink elephants, that's what I was reaching for. That's probably what happens when you put a, a rotten salmon in another bunch of uh, right. apples. Yeah. We've gone off. We've gone off that tracks. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. actually funny you said that about Twitch, John, just then because I think Twitch kind of died a death a few years ago. I was watching it like um, back, um, I don't know, 2015, 16. There seemed to be all of these huge streamers on there, like Doc Disrespect and Shroud and. It's and changing. It's, yeah, the just, the just chatting platforms and the just chatting places. streamers are what's growing, right? You get like, and they've added a lot. They've added like politics now. They've added oh, like, yes, but all these streamers are out there on their own, and mm-hmm. so that would be akin to us creating, you know, the furry tier under the anime, and then just letting that. Well, you know what would happen if we would let the furry community grow on its own without any like help and direction? It would turn into ten- tentacle stuff. <laughs> but but from from the sounds of things, what you're saying is, if you're not considering community from the moment you launch your platform or, or the or your product or the or your startup well you're a pretty selfish asshole if you just go out there and just build a just because you want to like have a bunch of people around you or something like oh, what are you even doing right i mean if you're not if you're not being thoughtful like in the beginning of like seeing it as just a marketing tool i, I suppose is the yeah well that's, that's disgusting that's why that's and you know what hacker news can sniff that out in 10 seconds that's why DigitalOcean was successful. I hired all my developer evangelists and I said, you talk about DigitalOcean one time, you're in trouble. Get out of here. See you later. Have fun. Make those communities successful. Bye. So again, so you hired them and then you told them if they spoke about it, they'd be in trouble. What do you mean? Yeah, like I didn't want them out there shilling DigitalOcean. That wasn't the point. So so you hired them and then you said not to talk about DigitalOcean in the community. It's, okay, you're basically saying don't badmouth it. but No, I'm saying... Your job at DigitalOcean is to be a good member of that community. That's it. Period. Okay. See ya. Whatever the community needs to make it move forward, needs money, needs resources, needs whatever. Your job is to just be a good member of the community. People will be able to Google them and look up their LinkedIn or or Twitter and find out they work for DigitalOcean and check it out if they want to. And, And in fact, in doing that, of being a good member of the community, you become a leader in the community and then you have a lot of exposure to everyone in the community and then you're the person that goes on stage at no js conference speaks before five thousand people and i don't and then i just can just be a line item underneath director of evangelism at digital ocean that's mm. all i need yeah it's like starting a parallel. because it's because it needs to, because because what you just said though right tim because of what you just said because mm. It has to be real to be real. It can't just be a marketing tool. It's if it's yeah. just a marketing tool, don't do it. Well, that's the thing. Um, that's to be honest with. It's just like a. Um, I don't want to go too far off topic, but it's something that I really struggle with. Um, is that the, these platforms now are like? I mean, I try and steer clear of a lot of them because I just think that it's just nonsense and like fake. But like, I think that LinkedIn, for example, is still heralded as this like it's still kind of on um you know up on its sort of stilts you know i think it's still got people think it has a lot of weight but i think that's the problem is it's so hard to spot what's real and what isn't and who's actually just being part of a community because they want to make the community good as opposed to just promoting themselves or like what's their vested interest why are they here is it because the algorithm has put them in front of me and all this stuff you know is that is that kind of playing against this kind of like digital community and like what we you know what the next step of 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 this kind of whole paradigm will be because people are kind of playing an algorithm they're writing messages in a certain way they're interacting with people in a certain way just to get what they think that the platform wants to get out of them or wants to give them if that makes sense yeah, it sounds sounds very noob to me this is very noob in what way well it doesn't work I mean, like it could work as a like growth hack or a short-term tactic, but it's not how you build a sustainable anything. 
I guess the better way to form that question yeah, is maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Sorry. I think what Tim's saying is that like because everyone is just exploiting whatever platform they're on in whatever way. Let's say LinkedIn. But is everyone doing that? They're not. Exactly. So I think what he's saying is like so doesn't this play against the whole building a digital community in general? Because you can how do you know which one is is a genuine community? So what I was gonna say is maybe which platforms or channels do you think are most reliable or have a, have the most like, you know? Well, and I think that's what I mean about it being like new, but like, because it's like, because if you've been around community building for 10 years, you really fundamentally know, like you there, that's not how, like you, that's what I said in the very beginning about like the, it doesn't spontaneously appear in my living room. It's a lot of work to go out there and get it. Right. Yeah. And like, playing like if you're playing an algorithm just to like like if you're advertising using algorithmic like if i'm going on um twitter and i'm very specifically building an advert about this meetup that into this sub community that i think like i said like going to the skate park and like saying hey i'm gonna have this meetup next weekend about this type of, of 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 skateboard you know anyone interested super passionate about skateboards should come or whatever right um, so sure, like, um, um, but, but, and that's fine, but like, is it, and then it's like, is it real value? Right. And so this whole thing about like the SEO game, I got a lot of, like a lot of people, when they come talk to me about the content marketing strategy, they start with SEO and it's like, well, why are you doing SEO? And it's like, well, that's an easy way to get this community built, right? If people are searching for this thing, well, they're not searching for that thing. You have to go out and get them. Right? <laughs> no one's <laughs> mystically, right? Like you have to go, like maybe some people are, but that's just cheap, right? It's not, it's not a good way to do it. Right. Um, just like, you know, hacking, hacking AdWords and like focusing on SEO, focusing on playing the LinkedIn algorithm. Like those are okay growth hacks when you really understand something and you say, okay, if I do this, this X, Y, Z, pull this lever, like it'll get in front of these people who I know hundred percent with certainty are going to be, uh, you know, interested in this thing. But the primary, if you're thinking about community building and you're thinking about leading communities, the primary focus of your thought is selfless thought, right? It's really like, um, it's like your, your, most of your time should be focused on how should I make this a great community that people like, how should I make this a great environment such that all these communities come together and I can have my own community that I can form community, the sub community, this community around this other topic or whatever. Right. And the community will build itself. If you've got it, if you hit it and you have good, like good, good frameworks and people add, and you're adding real value to people's lives and, and people are adding real value to each other. They'll spread the word. They'll do the, the customer evangelism. They'll do the community evangelism for you, right? You don't need to worry about all those things. Um, if you're at the level of like growth hacking your community, like I apologize for saying it's new, but like, it, I mean, it's just like you're, it's way like that's a single tiny tactic, right? And yeah, yeah, of and, it, and it's, and it's not even necessarily, um, it's probably doesn't even move the needle that much. Like you really want to be putting the, the brunt of your thought on who the personas, who are the people in the community? Who's here today? How can I add new people that would benefit them? Right. Yeah. That like if, if you have a group of like um, JavaScript developers and, and you want to like, and you want to, and you want to, um, you want to host like a conference for them or like a little meetup. Let's even just say a little meetup at your pub, uh, your local pub or whatever you put it out there. But so then you're going to say like, what's really relevant to JavaScript developers right now. Okay. It's like, um, Oh, like, I don't know. I'm not, I, it's been a while since I thought about JavaScript, but like, I think react is like a thing now. And, and like, I don't know, like Ember used to be a thing or whatever. Jake right? is the new so, thing, I think. Jquery, I've heard of that. John, John Resig, I think is that guy's name, but he's doing Japanese wood block painting now, actually. I think that's the natural. That's the natural evolution of all developers. Very, very interesting. One of my, one of my favorite people I've met in startup. I must say, John, wonderful man. Um, but anyway, awesome human. You should follow his socials. He's such a cool dude. I really like him. I had I dumplings with him in New York twice, and he. Anyway, um, 
Dumplings in New York. That's a good name for a book. What was my, or an album. Dumplings in New York. What was my point there? How about John? Oh, yeah, right. So, like, so like if, you know, the, the meetup is not just like, oh, we're having a JavaScript meetup and we're having pizza and beer. You know how many people that's what I hear? Like, oh, yeah, we're just going to have a JavaScript meetup, we're going to have pizza and beer, and a good speaker is going to come. Well, what's the value add to the JavaScript developers? Pizza and beer? Come on. I can buy, I'm a JavaScript developer, I work at Facebook, I can buy my own pizza and beer, right? And oh, so... I, I am running the community event tomorrow night, and my, my outreach to everyone is free beer and pizza. Right, but why is it not like... Free beer and pizza, I'll be there. You are. <laughs> but why is it not like, hey, I got this, I got this uh, uh, PhD in like um, organizational management from the University of Gothenburg, Sweden, to take the train down to see you all to talk about how to well, build healthier. Actually, it is. Right? I'm flying someone in from Barcelona to give a talk on product design, and the, <laughs> the beer and the pizza is just the extra carrot on the stick. I'm also launching a website with like a jobs board on it to give people some value to like to try and give them all the space to interact. Perfect. So, so that's yeah. and that's what I mean, right? It's like. I, was, I had some one of the uh, one of the t- Twitch content creators and come to me and they were asking the other day and they're like you're like I've started doing a little bit of um, streaming but I'm it's I'm gonna stop doing it soon and I, I'm not interested in anyone like trying to find it or anything I just yeah, did it you know quick, quick, yeah, I know sorry I just did it quickly just to see how the community building there works because I wanted to understand it. Um, and mine grew like relatively quickly. And so someone who has a probably like, you know, relative size community and, but it sort of stagnated. It was like, how did that happen? And I was like, well, I just thought about my community. Like, what is the genuine value add that I can provide? And then I spent every single time that I was doing that, trying to add that genuine value as selflessly as I can. Right. Like, and, and that works, it works. And so, Um, and I have found that to be true that it works everywhere. It works in it. Like leadership is just community building and growing. Doesn't like I've said this a million times in this, in this podcast, right? It doesn't matter if it's your team of five and in in, uh, the Kubernetes team and and then, you know, the, the sub pop bus of Google or, uh, or if it's, uh, or your church or your skateboard park or, or your local crochet club. If you if you're passionate about it, you want it to grow. You want to get involved in the community. You you're trying to build a community. Whatever, the first step is to genuinely care about your community. Period. That's it. It's not about you. Nothing. The all you, you should pretty much probably only just do it for morbid curiosity. I was like, either can I grow a healthy community, and I want to see that. Or I, I myself want to be a part of this community um, and, and, and get these new insights myself. And I re- But then recognizing that your job in the community is actually the leadership, that you're not really there to get super involved in. And, and having the humility to take that step back and say, I'm not really a tactical member of this community. So from the point of view of like a startup, like a founder listening out there who, or let's say like a dev relations who wants to build a community around a, a product or a platform that they've launched. Um, would you say the same things apply? It's about like building a, like a shared watering hole that, that provides value, but at the same time, it can't just be like a shill for their platform. It has to just be a place that is a selfless environment, you know, like, oh, you like drinking Kool-Aid, welcome to the Kool-Aid Appreciation Club. And then on the side, it's like, by the way, we also sell these Kool-Aid containers. Like, how do you like build community specifically for a startup? Yeah, but at the right. same time, keep yourself outside of the... That's why when people come to me, they come all to, what metrics and KPIs should I put around my developer evangelists? Yeah. None. Do people like them? You know, I have Michael Rogers. Michael Rogers. You know what my performance review for Michael Rogers was? I'd fly to whatever conference that he was speaking at, and i wander wandered around, and I'd ask people if they liked him. And if they liked him, he was doing a good job. Right? Likeability was like number one thing. People thought, or they, even if they didn't even like him, which a lot of people didn't like Michael, and that was fine. At least they, at least they would say Shout that he added Michael. value. Uh, I mean, All right, would <laughs> he wouldn't mind me saying that. He would say it's true. I mean, he, but that's you can't like you can't be a contributing member of a community without you know rub, rubbing a few people the wrong way because you have to you know in like Node.js, they're trying to move it forward as an open source project as as a church, you're trying to like move your spiritual beliefs forward and learn more about your, you know, spiritual existence or whatever. Um, you don't want anyone like, 
you, you want that to evolve over time because you want the community to stay for a long period of time. Um, and so, um, or you want the, the community to be around for a long period of time. And so, um, you know, the, w w like, no, there is like, it's, if you want, if, like, I would never get myself bent out of shape about KPI metrics around community building because that, that then just moves you into the territory of thinking about it as a tool. Right. Mm. And I'm like, if you want this tool as an actual tool, the only way you get it is by not seeing it as a tool. So I guess paradoxical in that regard. Right. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's why it's hard. It's why it's hard actually. And why only a few companies are successful at it. It's a really fast, this has been a really fascinating conversation. I feel like I've actually got more questions now than I did at the start <laughs> because it's just like what you're saying makes complete sense. And I completely am on board with what it is that you're like your philosophy and, and what you think makes this work. But I would say that like, I couldn't tell you a place where I would be able to go online to find that. Like I, you know, like live and breathe, um, web development, podcasting, Star Wars. I don't participate in any communities around that because I find them so toxic and uninteresting. And I feel that like, uh, if it was a community like what you're talking about, I would be the first in line. But I think that like, um, maybe it's just been, I think that maybe my, my experience of community building and communities has been so polluted by social media that it's just kind of like completely. I would say maybe you're just not aware of it. Cause what about the iron hat community? I know that you're a, you're a big fan of that community in general. I don't think you've had many negative experiences there. Yeah. I, I think, I think I haven't had any real negative experiences there at all. In fact, I, I love that community. You're right. But it's just like this, what, what John is talking about from a slightly different point of view, where you're talking about like a, um, you know, talk about Dev the way that you're talking about deviant art. Like I wouldn't, be able to tell you where that exists online now well like, let me ask you let me ask you then tim but i think sort of i'm such i always feel like i say all these things and everyone's like wow this guy's such an asshole but like it's a little bit lazy right like then either go build it yourself and like cool or go steward another community so that it's better and, and add value to everyone right yeah. like yeah. You can see communities turn from toxic to not. It doesn't happen often, but it requires some forces within them to be selfless and say, I'm just for the next six months going to steward this community. I'm not even going to participate in it. I mean, most people don't want to do that. We're lucky in the deviant art days, but the internet's changed a lot since now. I don't, I don't mean like, I don't mean you're lazy, Tim, or anything like that. Like it's not a shot at you. Yeah, it's I've taken it personally. I'm deleting the podcast off you finished talking. No, you know, I even wanted to actually quickly say like, even with the thing I say, I always say there are these things. So I just try and say things as honestly as I can. But like, even with Ben before, like this, keep in mind, this was like six months into DigitalOcean. Like he then, you know, hunkered down and obviously now it's a publicly traded company. And, and that's why I stayed at DigitalOcean and love Ben. He's an amazing, I think he's an amazing leader because he listened. He fought me at the, at the start and he was like, what do you mean I'm not building DigitalOcean? Like, look at all this stuff I'm doing. And then he thought about it for a little while. And then he came back to me and he said, all right, okay, so let's let's build DigitalOcean. And then we did. And it was awesome. But if I had never had that conversation with him, and I think he would admit, I don't know, maybe DigitalOcean would be a different place. But it took a lot of courage. Well, you know, I mean, now, I guess now that I'm older, it's easier. To, it took a lot of courage then. Now I don't really have problems having those conversations because I've had them a lot and I've seen the positive success that comes from them. Yeah. Um, difficult conversations are difficult, but they're necessary. Hmm. I guess as well, it's that, that whole level of, um, the amount of Kool-Aid you're willing to drink to sort of like get yourself in that position where you can do the stuff. Like, cause I, I feel, I know, I know what you mean about the laziness, but I, I think genuinely from my point of view, it's more just like burnout of doing that stuff. I don't, I don't use any other social media except for LinkedIn, for example. And like trying to wade through that to try and find people who are genuinely interesting to talk to on the podcast, for example. I don't even use that anymore. I took mine down. Yeah, you t you disappeared entirely, almost entirely off, off social media, John, I noticed. Well. <laughs> it might be like linked to what Tim's saying is why I asked, yeah. When I was at DigitalOcean, I had like, oh, when I had, when I was at DigitalOcean, I had like almost 30,000 followers on Twitter. So I, I didn't, I've never had Facebook since like after college because I just didn't, never liked Facebook particularly. Um, it's not even about the data or private, like I, whatever, like advertise to me, baby, I don't care. Um, I just, I don't like Facebook. Um, and then I like Twitter 
And then it was really useful for me when I was building DigitalOcean because it was a good way for me to communicate with people and, and answer like real time support requests and stuff like that. And then when I was started my own startup, I decided it was like doing everything I could do to create as much focus, like guardrails for focus guardrails for myself as possible. And also like emotional focus guardrails, right? Like too easy to go on there and look at another founder and compare myself to them too easy to say the wrong thing, get shot down by a partner and spend the afternoon being pissed off about it and not focusing on like a performance review or some other thing that I should be doing in my job. And I think that's just like comes down to ruthless prioritization of my, of my emotional energy and my, and my literal time. Right. Um, only doing the things that I actually are net net positive uh, and anything that's on the on the line just gone. So I've never had any issue getting jobs, and I find that LinkedIn has turned into uh, Facebook. And anyone who knows me knows me and can attest to the work that I've done in the past with them. And I'm not worried about the next five or six years or ten years of of working, which is a huge privilege. I will put that out there right now. Massive, massive privilege. Um, and so I'm sick of recruiter spam and all the emails from LinkedIn. So that was that. I was like, you're not adding any value to my life. I'm out. You know, it pissed everyone else off a lot because they were like, yeah, but I have to actually, I have to explain who you are properly to people now. I can't just copy and paste the links. Like, oh, well, yeah, it's yeah. too bad. It's so bad. And I did the same thing. I tried to try to explain who you were to Tim, and I was like, "Fuck, I can't even send you this." This is dude, I know. <laughs> Drinks a lot. Sorry, I mean it's just because, like, I don't know. I just like I said. But what are we going to post in the description of the podcast? We can't even put like. We just have to put this is John Edgar, no link. Man in Canada. You can go to my website. It's got my. It's got my resume. What's that? Right, we're going to plug that right now. H four X dot club C L U B. H4X.club. I look that up right now. I feel That's... like I feel like we could continue this conversation for another five hours, but I think at some point we're going to have to say thank you for joining us because I really, uh, I really could just keep going. <laughs> oh my um, god, this is a dope website. It's just black with green HTML. It's just Markdown. <laughs> Check yeah. this website. Oh no, <laughs> it's very nice. I like that. Yeah, because it was just like I wanted something like. Well, I was just solving the problem. It was like someone needs a link to say what I do, so there's the link. And then I just wanted it to be basic and sort of like not really anything about anything except just my resume. It's my resume. That's it. I mean, like, what do I need? Like, you you want to see my face? Like, give me a FaceTime call. No problem. I'm happy to smile down the phone.